In this video, we're reviewing another Brad Owen hand, this time comparing the analysis of a solver and Mr. Fuck GTO himself, Charlie Corral. Now, given Charlie's very vocal opposition to GTO in the past, you might expect to see that the advice given by Charlie and the solver will be miles apart. But will the reality live up to this expectation? Well, let's find out. We're in the hijack and we get under a defend the from coals, the under the gun. Heads up in position. The flop is king four deuce rainbow. We have one over and some backdoor draws. Under the gun checks. There's a good chance that I have the best hand. I down bet to 100 just to get some weaker hands but still have equity to fold. I can continue to fire on future streets if I pick up draws. The opponent calls, he could have a king or maybe he has a medium or small pair. So, let's the turn is the queen of so this hand comes from a 10-20 game at the Bellagio with a $40 straddle and a big blind ante. So it's a big game, and in fact it's the biggest game Brad has ever played. Brad is in the hijack with ace queen of diamonds and he raises it to $120 and the straddle defends. Now GTO check doesn't currently support straddle games, so I had to manipulate a hand history to match up the stack sizes and the pot and then I imported straddle ranges I got from range converter, which seemed to be pretty reasonable for the circumstances. The flop comes king for deuce rainbow and Brad c bets around third pot and villain calls. Brad's primary purpose for this play is to protect his holding by trying to get weaker hands with some equity to fold, and we see that the solver does like this bet, firing it with nearly two thirds of Brad's range. Brad has a significant advantage throughout the range, and so on this dry board, Villain should have plenty of auto folds against this bet. We see that at the equilibrium, Villain should be folding over 40% of its range versus this small bet, and when we isolate the bottom 40th percentile of Villain's hands, we see why this is. Villain has a lot of junky, weak, overcard hands with no draws that will not be very eager to continue out of position facing a stronger range. In fact, if Brad wanted to just see bet his entire range, we see that the maximum amount he would lose compared to the GTO solution is only 1.7% of the pot, or around .006 big blinds. And as Brad alluded to, even if Villain doesn't fold, Brad has many outs and many turn and river cards he can continue barreling on. Right, he has both the backdoor flush and straight draws, so even if he doesn't hit an ace or queen, he can still pick up equity with any diamond, jack, or ten. The turn is the queen of clubs. We improved the second pair. Under the gun checks. I no longer need to bluff with my hand. So the question is, on the queen, do we want to bet or check? And I can see an argument for betting. Now, I think that most people would just auto-check it, and I completely understand that. The argument for betting would be that we can kind of just try and get value from under pairs like, you know, nines through fives by just betting like 120 or something like that and we can get value from 4x and deuce x if he decides if he decides to call it the, also another good thing about that is that if he does have something like king x which is by far his most likely hand we get to lose a lot less or we don't have to face a, a river decision and i check back for pot control i'd like to get the showdown the turn is the queen of clubs giving brad second pair and he decides to check back to pot control Charlie, on the other hand, brings up the possibility of continuing to barrel, and although the solver is mostly checking back, it does throw in a minor frequency of small bets, and we see that the EB regret for betting third pot with all second pairs is actually very low. Charlie cites two arguments in favor of a small bet. One, he believes that a small bet could get called by worse hands, and this is clearly the case. If we isolate Brad's specific combo, we see that it has around 65% equity, so it's ahead of most of Villain's range, and against a third pot bet, Villain should only fold around 26% of his range. So to roughly estimate the types of worse hands Villain could call with, we can brush his equity distribution above the 26th percentile and below Brad's ace-queen. And when we do this, we see that Villain should call a third pot bet with weaker queen x, as well as lower pocket pairs, 4x, deuce x, and straight draws as well. And these weaker calling combos comprise around 45% of Villain's entire range. Secondly, Charlie mentions that betting in position on the turn will likely buy Brad a free pass on the river, which may save him some money if he's up against king x or better. Now this is a concept that you won't learn from a solver, but it is a trick that I think in practice can be very powerful, particularly in a live environment, where it seems that most people tend to not donk as much, especially with medium strength hands. 
River is the five of diamonds. Under the gun isn't checking for a third time. He bets 400. So 400 into, uh, into 490. Here's a question. Name the bluffs. Name the bluffs that the villain has. I'm trying to think of one. I'm trying to think of one. Give me a sec, guys. Give me a sec. Don't rush me. Don't rush me. Hmm. Jack 10 of hearts. Boom! Boom! Come at me. Jack 10 of hearts. Jack 10 of spades. Oh, God. We're just crushing. I don't think ace 10 and ace jack bluff here. I just think that they're good often enough. I, they're, they're not going to be bluffing do sex or pocket threes. I, I, I think jack 10 suited might literally be the only combo. Now, let's name some value hands. Every king, I think that's definitely a reasonable prognosis. <laughs> Ace three, pocket fours, pocket fives, king, queen, sets, deuces, fours, fives. Uh, we've got some queen four, some queen deuces. It's very, very, very tough to find uh, bluffs here. I see a million value combos. I see, I was genuinely tr struggling. I, that wasn't an act. I was genuinely struggling to find a bluff. Uh, so I, I think this is by far a clear fault, his... but let's see if I get proven to be stupid. The river is the five of diamonds and villain bets around 80% of pot. So what should Brad do? Well, according to Charlie, this is a clear fold. He justifies his assessment by considering the likely bluffs and likely value combos that villain has in his range. On the one hand, Charlie was able to rattle off a laundry list of potential value combos that Brad is likely behind, and we can clearly visualize Villain's abundance of value combos in the equity graph. We see this straight line of combos near the top of the equity distribution, where nearly 70% of Villain's range is comprised of combos with around 80% equity or more. As Charlie pointed out, Villain's likely hands in this class include Ace-3 for the straight, pocket fours and pocket fives, king-queen, and plenty of king-x combos. On the flip side, Charlie struggled to think of any bluffs that are likely to be in villain's range, only coming up with jack-10 suited, which, although probably in most players' actual ranges, is not in the solver's range, since the preflop sim we use 3-bet jack-10 suited with 100% frequency. So based on Charlie's assessment of villain's wealth of likely value combos and lack of likely bluff combos, he views this spot as an easy fold. Notice that Charlie didn't discuss card rank or card removal, and we can infer from this that he doesn't believe that Brad should be bluff catching with marginal hands at all in this spot. And given that an 80% pot bet on this king high board is likely only to be made by king x or better, if we were to extrapolate Charlie's logic across all of Brad's marginal combos, it would mean in turn that Charlie believes that Brad should fold all second pairs and below. So what does the solver say about this spot? Well, not surprisingly, in contrast, the solver does do some bluff catching. It's calling most queen x and even some lower pairs as well. Interestingly, ace queen of diamonds specifically is mostly folding, but the solver is calling with most lower ranked queen x combos. So why is this? Well, the first thing that I always advocate doing in a marginal calling spot is to identify the weakest value combo that villain is likely to have because this helps orient where we are versus villain's equity distribution. In this case, as mentioned, the weakest value combo in villain's range is likely top pair, which essentially means that all of Brad's pairs below a king are mere bluff catchers with roughly the same showdown value. And we can visualize this dynamic in the equity graph where we have this long horizontal line of combos with nearly equivalent equity. In fact, 60% or so of Brad's range has between 25% to 40% equity, which we see is comprised of hands as strong as ace-queen and hands as weak as bottom pair. The reason why we have this broad spectrum of hands with similar equity profiles is that when you're facing a polarizing bet, the rank of your hand typically will not be the most critical factor. Rank can have some importance if villain is merging its bet by including some middle strength hands, but generally when facing a polarizing bet, we can lump all marginal hands in the same category as being weaker than villain's value combos and being stronger than most of his bluffs. So the next obvious question is, how do we differentiate among these combos since we can't simply call or fold all of them from a GTO perspective 
as they make up most of our range? Well, the answer to this question, at least in GTO world, lies in card removal. We differentiate among our bluff catchers based on their probability altering characteristics. That is, we want to call with hands that block villains' strongest combos and or that unblock villains' weakest combos because these effects mathematically alter the probabilities of villains' likelihood of holding a value or a bluff. So first, let's isolate Brad's bluff catchers with the lowest unblocker scores. When we do this, we see that these hands are folding on average 83% of the time, with an EV regret of 0.3% of the pot. And we see that Brad's ace queen of diamonds is actually in this group. Now, let's isolate Brad's bluff catchers with the highest unblocker scores, which we see are defending over 90% of the time. And if we remove 6-5 suited, which is being turned into a bluff, we see that the EV regret for calling all of these hands is just 0.1%. So what is the difference here? Well, it all comes down to villain's bluffing range. When we isolate villain's weakest hands, we see that some of the most prevalent combos are 7-6 and 8-6 suited of hearts, diamonds, or spades, which floated the flop with double backdoors. Also prevalent in the range are ace-8 and ace-7 suited of hearts, diamonds, or spades, which floated the flop with the over and backdoor flush draw. And when we go back to villain's river decision, we see that the solver was checking ace-9 and above, which have a bit more showdown value, but was essentially bluffing all hands ace-8 and below. So given this, it makes sense that Brad doesn't want to bluff catch with a 7, 8, or ace of hearts, diamonds, or spades, since holding these combos will decrease the probability that Dylan has one of these bluffs. And in this I call, we see that the opponent rivered a set of fives. We get sucked out on again, we pay off a large river bet again, there's no more cushion to work with, I'm not winning in this game, and I'm actually down a little on the deck. Brad ends up calling and getting shown pocket fives for a rivered set. So who wins this battle between the solver and Charlie Corral? Well, given that the solver was indifferent between calling and folding Brad's hand, and in contrast, Charlie said this was a clear fold, I would have to begrudgingly give this one to Charlie. Now, some of you GTO nerds watching this are likely shocked and outraged by my verdict, especially given the fact that according to Charlie's logic, not only should have Brad folded his ace queen of diamonds, which had a bad unblocker, he should have folded all queen x, which the solver was mostly calling. However, we have to remember that the solver was calling these hands as the highest EV play based on the assumption that Villain had a balanced bluffing range on the river. But does that assumption match the reality? Remember, the most prevalent bluffing combos in Villain's range were 7-6, 8-6, Ace-8, and Ace-7 with backdoors. But in real life, are live players floating with these types of combos on the flop? My guess is probably not. And if Villain is not floating these types of very marginal hands, but rather defends with too strong of a range, then folding all bluff catchers will actually be the highest EV play. And we can demonstrate this objectively by node locking Villain's river betting range. So here we're looking at the perfectly balanced GTO bluffing range on the river in Villain's shoes. And let's manipulate this range so that Villain is bluffing these combos at a maximum of 10% of the time, but it does bluff Jack-10 100% of the time, which was the only bluff combo Charlie could think of. And when we recalculate the EV maximizing strategy against this diminished bluffing range, we see that the solver now folds 100% of its hands below second pair. In other words, even when we do give Villain some bluffs, which many players likely wouldn't even have in real life, if Villain doesn't have precisely the sufficient number of bluff combos to balance his value in accordance with GTO, the EV maximizing defense will change dramatically where most, if not all, bluff catchers transform into pure folds. So given that no human will ever be able to precisely replicate GTO's value to bluff ratios in every spot, does it mean that Charlie has been right all along and that GTO is useless? Well, not exactly. There are two preconditions which must always be true in order for this type of exploitative strategy to be the most profit maximizing over the long run. One, we need to be certain that our opponent is unbalanced and how he's unbalanced. And two, our opponent must not be able to adjust to our exploit. 
If either of these conditions turn out not to be true, then ultimately what we've done by trying to exploit our opponent is we have intentionally made our own strategies unbalanced and vulnerable. For example, if we decide to fold all bluff catchers, we could easily be run over by someone that naturally overbluffs or someone that recognizes the fact that we aren't bluff catching and then shifts his strategies to overbluff. Right? Although Phil Ivey may have never used a solver in his life and it's likely exploitable, if you were actually playing against him and tried to exploit his imbalances, he's likely going to be able to quickly figure out what you're doing and adjust. And good luck trying to outlevel Phil Ivey in real life. Additionally, many overestimate their ability to read their opponents and they often do this with very little to no evidence, which can lead to disastrous results. So while it is true that there are plenty of examples of exploitative players that have been very successful without ever having picked up a solver, when it comes to the question of the best way for most people to learn poker, successful exploitative players may not be the best models to try to emulate. Typically, there are two traits that successful exploitative players have in common, which not everyone possesses. One, they usually have very strong analytical abilities, particularly when it comes to reading other people. Some may call this white magic, which is likely an innate quality that may not even be learnable. Second, successful exploitative players usually have been playing for a very long time and have seen countless hands, for which there is no substitute. These two qualities, reading ability and experience, are often summed up in one word, intuition. However, the problem with intuition is that it is, by definition, not based on conscious reasoning. And if something is not based on conscious reasoning, it becomes very difficult to teach and learn. For example, although Charlie was able to articulate some specific factors he consciously took into account when giving his advice, there were likely many other subconscious factors that his mind processed under the hood, which he has developed over years and years and millions of hands of playing. Notice that in order for Charlie's river assessment in this hand to have been correct, it was necessary for Villain to have underfloated Brad's small flop bet. But Charlie never even articulated this fact. So how did he know that Villain was underfloating the flop? I'm guessing if we asked him, his answer would be he just knows based on experience. But how are we supposed to download this type of intuitive knowledge, which we would need to do not just for this spot, but for every other spot we will encounter as well? The transmission of this type of knowledge can be very difficult because someone like Charlie cannot even himself consciously decompile all of the factors that his mind takes into account when making a decision. In contrast, all of the factors that drive solver strategies are an open book and laid bare in objective, measurable data. We can analyze and manipulate each of these factors in the form of metrics and visualizations, which makes learning GTO just like learning any other subject matter which is based on objective truths, like math, physics, or biology. With some effort and dedication, anyone can learn these strategies, and it doesn't require you to be a telepath and it doesn't take decades or millions of hands to do it. Additionally, once you have a solid understanding of GTO, it will fast track your ability to exploit as well. Although many try to paint GTO and exploitative play as two separate universes, the reality is that there is actually just one small difference between them, which is the assumptions we make about our opponent's strategies. In GTO, we assume our opponent is playing in a perfectly balanced manner, and in an exploitative play, we assume our opponent has some specific identifiable defect in their game. However, both methodologies share the same goal, to maximize EV. Right, in articulating his reasoning, you may have noticed that Charlie used much of the same language and concepts that I often use in my videos when interpreting solver results. Essentially, he constructed ranges for both hero and villain based on their prior actions, and then determined the EV maximizing play based on an assessment of probabilities. In this particular case, given Villain's call on the flop and large bet on the river, in Charlie's view, the number of value combos in Villain's range likely far outweighed bluffs, which, as a matter of probabilities, meant that Brad's second pair was likely no good. So if it's the case that GTO and exploitative play are actually closely related, why is it that Charlie and many others have, in the past, said fuck GTO? Well, I don't want to put words in Charlie's mouth, but if I had to guess, 
What he really means by this is fuck rigidly trying to rotely memorize and apply GTO without taking into account human factors. And this is a sentiment that I actually fully agree with. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay balanced.